It'll be in First Peter chapter one. And we'll probably be on this theme for the next couple, three Sundays. It's it's a huge uh, discussion. <clears throat> And that is the importance of the blood of Christ um, in the atonement. So, um, just wow, a lot of information here, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Um, I've been breaking out the board, but I'm not going to today. We're just going to go through it. Let's look. Well, before we read this, let me give you by way of review some things. Again, the only time we see the word atonement is Romans 5.11, and that's, in, of course, in the New Testament. It says, not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement. Uh, again, all religions except Christianity all say do. You've got to do something to go to heaven. You've got to do something to be saved. You've got to do something to earn God's favor. <coughs> And as we found out this morning in the doctrinal teaching time, you don't even know God until you're born again. Amen? Right. Well, Christianity doesn't say do. It says done. It's all done through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we have wonderful verses like Titus 3, 5, which says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, um, and for you are saved by grace through faith. <laughs> Amen. Uh, how's it go? Not of work. How's it go? Somebody help me. By grace yourselves. You for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank Amen. you very much. But it all comes down to it. If we could earn our way, we could boast. We'd get to heaven and we'd say, well, how did you get here? Well, I did this and I did that. It's not going to be that way at all, amen? The only people that's going to be in heaven are those who have been born again by the grace of God, by the power of His Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel. Now, anyway, even though the word atonement is only used once in the New Testament, the, the atonement of Christ is the central theme throughout the Word of God. Amen. And we've seen that before. We're going to uh, look again now. What does atonement mean? What does that word mean? It means to cover or to protect. Um, you know, the Lord, when Adam and Eve had sinned, and they found they were naked in Genesis 3.21, He gave them coats of skin. He covered them. He atoned them, so to speak. We're not talking about salvation. But He did give the first picture of of sacrifice. Um, we saw where Noah uh, pitched the ark <clears throat> within and without with pitch, which caused him to um, uh, have it protected or covered so it wouldn't leak. Amen. Where our recordings today are, are probably horrendous. But anyway. <clears throat> We also see the word atonement is a Middle English word, which could actually mean, if you divided it up, at one meant. At one meant. In other words, uh, we see the word atonement in the New Testament, but we also see it used as reconciling, same word, and reconciliation. And what it means is to have the enmity removed between two enemies. Those two enemies are reconciled. In other words, thank God we've been covered by uh, Christ's blood from the wrath of God. Amen. But anyway, we looked at the necessity of the atonement, and we learned that it was to satisfy both the holiness and love natures of God. Amen. We talked a little bit about that Wednesday night, so I won't go too far into it, but uh, his number one attribute is holiness. However, he cannot be holy, and his love suffers. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God is love. And he can't show his love and then holiness suffer. He is who he is. Amen. Both of them have to be fulfilled. So the atonement is the only way that that could take place. We also learned some doctrinal terms relating to Christ's death to man. 
We learned that it is the substitution. I think that's something that should be preached every time we get together. That Christ died for our sins in our place. We deserve the death, but Christ died for us. You're a sinner. You hate God, and Christ died for you anyway. Amen? That's the substitution. Uh, also, another doctrinal term relating to the atonement is the word vicarious. Vicarious. In place of. In other words, it substitutes not only generally, but it actually is vicarious. Actually carries through for every man that is born again. It also is the word propitiation. Propitiation, where the wrath of God is satisfied and then now the one who was formerly the, the um, uh, target of that wrath is now able to walk with God. The word redemption, where Christ's blood was shed to purchase us. Purchase us. He bought us. And then, of course, the word reconciliation, where we can get along with God and, and so on. So anyway, we've talked a whole lot about the atonement over past weeks. But today I want to start talking about the importance of the blood. The importance of the blood in the atonement. If you look first here at 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, he says, For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Now, notice he says that we were redeemed in verse 19 with the precious blood of Christ. Okay? Now, like Cain, a lot of people want a... Um, what, what we would call a bloodless gospel. Okay, what I mean by that is, is a, they want a way of salvation based on their personal labors. You know, they, they think of the bloody cross and, and it's an offense to them. It's ugly. And, and, uh, but the problem is the reason it's an offense, the reason the cross is such an offense to sinners is because it declares His true nature in the sight of God. That's what God thinks about sin. Amen? We ought to look to the cross and see ourselves and how God sees our sin. Now, the thing is, is we've all been long ridiculed for our what, what I've heard called slaughterhouse religion uh, and several uh, perversions in, in modern America uh, of the Bible, they omit references to the blood of Christ. And even some of the newer hymns, or hymn books, I should say, uh, produce songs where they take the blood out. Even some of the more conservative ranks of Christendom, um, they deny still the necessity of the blood, arguing that it was Christ's death which was essential. And his blood was only incidental. John MacArthur defamed the precious blood of Christ by asserting that it was only the death of Christ which was important, the blood being incidental and non-essential. I don't know what Bible that man's reading. Okay? Now, according to the Bible, the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ is absolutely essential to the atonement. Amen. We've talked about the atonement. Now we're where the rubber meets the road. It's the blood that atones. Amen? So first of all, let me just point out a few things and, and I'm going to keep it short because I want to keep this fresh in your minds and I'm going to review you next time we talk about the atonement and the importance of the blood. Again, this will probably cover three, maybe four messages. So uh, we have to understand that it's the blood that washed us free from sin. Amen? Anyway, the first thing I want to point out to you today 
is that the blood is demanded. The blood is demanded. In Luke 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Does it say the lamb made an atonement? No. Did it say the priest made an atonement? No. It said the blood made an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So we see the mind of God here that it has to be blood that makes atonement. In Hebrews 9 and verse 22, he says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And he said, wait a minute, brother, uh, the atonement, uh, speaking of the atonement, it says almost all things are purged by the blood. Aren't all things purged by the blood? No, he's saying that some things are purged by fire. Some things are purged by water. When you wash your dishes, you don't burn them. You wash them. Amen. It's purged. He says almost all things are purged with blood. And then he says this, And without shedding of blood is no remission. Remission. It goes right along with atonement. Almost the same exact meaning. In Exodus 12, 13, it says, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, not the lamb they were eating, not the family ready to go, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. What I'm trying to tell you, God demands blood for atonement, so our Lord had to bleed and die. He had to bleed and die. Just die wasn't enough. He had to bleed and die. Let me read a few things to you here. And you can turn if you want to, but I'm going to be in Romans chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 6 through 9, keeping in mind that our Lord had to bleed and die. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man would some even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now so far, it's saying that His death is what made the difference. Amen? But the very next verse says, Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. It is not Christ's death that saved us from the wrath to come. It is His blood that saved us from the wrath to come. And we're going to get into more detail. I can't cover it all in one message. I don't want to bore you. But as we get going, we're going to talk more about how the blood washes, how it covers. What does the Bible have to say about it? Amen? If there's one thing we ought to know as a church is that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes away sins. Amen? All right. So we see, first of all, the blood is defined. The next thing I want to point out to you is that the blood is detailed. It's detailed. A uh, lot of verses to turn to. I'm not going to turn to them right now. I may have you turn at future times and so on. We've studied together the book of Hebrews so much. You kind of know what I'm referring to as we go. But I want to tell you that like a crimson cord... The, the doctrine of the blood of Christ runs through the Bible. It's the, it's the thread like was in Rahab's window that kept her from being killed by the Israelites when they took over Jericho. Here, put this red cord, sew it into your window there, and that's the way it is through the Bible, is that it is a constant theme. And it begins immediately after the entrance of sin... And fallen man. The first thing we see that God does is He takes the coats of animals and covers Adam and Eve. Now, uh, I've not seen too many animals lose their skin and live through that. Amen? In other words, we already saw the atonement. We already saw blood. Anyways, this same blood theme runs all the way through Abel. Amen. He offered a blood sacrifice. That's why he found favor with God to where Cain had a bloodless sacrifice based on his works. That same blood goes all the way through. Exodus 12, when I see the blood, 
I will pass over you. Amen. All the way to Revelation and Revelation 1 and verse 5, who has washed us in his own blood is what it says. I love a message I heard a long time ago where Abel brought his sacrifice and we see the blood of the lamb for one man. There he goes. He brings that sacrifice to God and he was justified before God because of that. And of course, it was all symbolic based upon the true blood that was shed by Jesus Christ. So then there you go. You see a lamb for a man. But then in Exodus 12, you see a whole family behind the door. Uh, they're eating that lamb and they're eating those bitter herbs and out there on the lintel of that door is the blood of that lamb. Exactly the way God said. So now, as you go through the Scriptures, we're building up. You saw a lamb for a man. Then you see a lamb for a family. Amen. A lamb for a family. And then, on the Day of Atonement, in, in I believe it's Leviticus 17, it teaches us that they would bring that scapegoat, perform the scapegoat ritual, and they would bring the blood of that other goat in, and, and that blood will be shed on the mercy seat for the whole nation. You'd see a, a nation, a lamb for a whole nation. Could all America be saved? Why, yes, if it all got washed in the blood of the lamb. Amen. But then, thank God, in John 1 and verse 29, you see a lamb for the whole world. And this was not a shadow. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming over the hill, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. It's all about the blood, folks, all the way through the Bible. The, the, the blood is detailed. Amen. Uh, we saw the offerings and the sacrifices of the Old Testament, that they were blood sacrifices. And the book of Hebrews describes for us and explains that they were just types. They were just shadows. And they were pointing to God's perfect Son, Jesus Christ, and the fact that He would shed His blood. You say, how do you know He shed His blood? Because it's demanded. It's demanded and it's detailed. Let me give you one other thing and we'll close it off. The blood is depicted. Depicted. The Lord gave to this church the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And it's for perpetual observance until He comes. That's what we're, as a matter of fact, we probably need to take it real soon. Now in this memorial, when we sit together at that table, the cup contains the fruit of the vine. And according to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five 25 and Matthew 26, 28 and Mark 14, 24, it symbolizes His shed blood. If the blood wasn't important, we wouldn't have the cup. Amen? If the blood were incidental and non-essential to the atonement, then we could ask a few questions about this Lord's table we observe. Like, for instance, why have the cup at all? I mean, if the bread, which is Christ's body, was broken for us, and that's the only thing essential, why do we even need the cup? Amen. Well, well, Christ said to have it because it's, it's the blood. Here's another one. If, if, if that's not important, the blood's not important and the symbolism of it not important through wine, as the Bible says, or the fruit of the vine, why not just drink water? I mean, think about that at the Lord's Supper. Why not just drink water? See, Christ shed water as well as blood. John 19, 34 says... And uh, wouldn't it be easier to serve water at the Lord's table? Now think about it. We can go to the store and buy grape juice. But back in this day, you had, to, you had to stamp that stuff out. You had to grow it, stomp it out, preserve it so that you could drink it for the Lord's Supper. Wouldn't it have been a whole lot easier just to use water? Not to mention that the fact that it would have kept a lot of deceived people from becoming drunkards. There's especially a lot of the sovereign grace Baptists, these, these Calvinistic Baptists, they believe um, that you take uh, real wine, fermented wine at the Lord's Supper. Now their ideology is this. 
And if it were just based on this, they might have an argument. But the ideology or their thought behind it is that, well, once it's fermented, it will be pure forever. It'll never, it'll never rot. It'll never ferment again. Okay? All right. I mean, you could have a bottle of wine that's 100 years old. It's supposed to be better than when it was made. However, uh, first of all, if it's fermented, the blood of Jesus Christ does not rot. We're going to learn more about that here in a minute. The second thing is for man to cause that stuff to ferment and to make it palatable, if you want to call it palatable, uh, he has to put his hands on it. You have to use yeast and some other things. What's another word for yeast in the Bible? Leaven. Leaven. Leaven uh, is a picture of sin, no matter how you use it. Amen. Even Paul says, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Amen. And he was talking about a sinner inside that church at Corinth. You let this one guy get by with this, and before you know it, the whole, whole group will be in a mess. Amen. So I don't believe for a second that the wine at the Lord's table is to be fermented. Amen. I believe it's supposed to be symbolic of the Lord's blood, which we're going to find uh, in subsequent uh, lessons that it's fresh. Amen. So are his wounds, by the way. His wounds are fresh. A lot of gospel songs talk about Christ's scars. Mm, they're fresh. He's, he's a lamb. Uh, what did they see in uh, Revelation 5? John saw a lamb as it had been slain. Amen. You could tell it, it was cut up. It was right there. It's fresh. Uh, Jesus said, touch my hands. And he had him put, put his hand in the hole of his side. Amen. It wasn't a scar. It was a hole there. Amen. So he's fresh, still fresh. <laughs> That's something, isn't it? But it shows the blood. Now, there's a whole lot more we can talk about. But today, I hope that at least starting right now, I've started to whet your appetite on the blood of Christ. I want you to understand that the only way a person can be saved, that can know God, is through the blood of His Son. If it's not through the blood, then it's not at all. Amen? Christ shed His blood, and I believe He shed all of it. Every drop. You know, when they offered those lambs, they'd have to hang that thing up and bleed out every drop of that thing. And I believe that's what Jesus did. I believe that blood... Uh, it was all over the cross. I believe it was on the ground. I believe it was made a trail from Pilate's Hall all the way out there. But the Holy Ghost of God kept that blood and it is on God's mercy seat. Praise God. Amen. And through that, all nations can be saved. Amen. Thank God for the blood. Amen. So I'm going to stop right there. God bless you. There, there's a whole lot more, um, but we'll, we'll get to it as we go. Amen. So anyway, thank you for a great day, everybody. Thank you for a good meal, ladies. Uh, I really appreciate that. That's really good food today. Um, I don't know if I liked the cake. I'm thinking maybe I might need a, a second opinion, which I can provide, amen, if I need to. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having a message that's 23 minutes, is there? No, I, because if I go anymore, we're going to drag it out and it's hot and uh, it's Sunday. I'm, and I, I like to see this man go get some rest before he has to work tonight. Uh, pray for my wife. She's um, uh, at home. You know, I took her home. Pray for the Alexanders. We're praying for them to be back with us Sunday. I miss them when they're gone. Don't you don't tell him I said that. <laughs> Amen. Don't tell him that. He, he, I still got him thinking I don't like him. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> anyway, let's let's close now. God bless you.